Ryan Craig, welcome to the show. Brett, great to be with you. So you got a book out, A New You, and it's you, just the letter U, Faster, Cheaper Alternatives to College. I love this book because we were just talking earlier. I've got two young kids. I'm saving money for college like you're supposed to, like you've been told you're supposed to do. But I'm always curious, like, man, is college even going to exist in 10 years? And in this book, you highlight some alternatives that are popping up that might even replace college. So before we get there, let's talk about this idea that, you know, I'm working on the assumption that if you want to succeed in life, get a good job, you got to go to college, right? That's what I did. What my parents did. How did we get to this point where college was deemed like a necessary requirement to get a good job? Because that wasn't always the case, right? Right. No, that's exactly right. And I, t- I talk about that at length in the, uh, in, the, in the book. You know, up until, you know, the end of World War II, 1950, only about uh, 5% of U.S. working adults actually had college degrees. So it was really, uh, and if you go back and look at the history of college as an institution, colleges uh, really began as a way in America, at least as a way for the merchant elite to sort of distinguish or differentiate their kids from the kids of the hoi polloi. (laughs) So it really began as a, um, uh, if you will, elitist exercise, which is not to, you know, diminish or demean the caliber of education that that occurred. Uh, there's no question that uh, a lot of cognitive skill building went uh, went into it. You know, most of our founding fathers had attended college, and 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 it showed. But the reality was that it was uh, it was a rarity up until sort of the end of World War II, and then really from sort of 1950 to the sort of you know mid 80s, early 90s, it it really became the sole pathway. It really became uh, either you go to college. Or, you know, the alternative is sort of skid row. Of course, that wasn't true. There, there, there remained and, and remain today a, a whole host of, of professions that don't, don't require four-year college. But that was the, the perception. And so sort of a, a striving, upwardly mobile couple, you know, having children, they would, you know, add to the list of things that they want for their child. College became the thing. And saving for college became important too, but not until later, <laughs> because not until the cost of college really began to rise out of control. That's really been over the last 30, 30 years or so. Yeah, we'll get into that in a bit. But what I think is interesting, you, you talk about this in the book too, is that colleges never, like even in the, starting in the 1950s, after the GIs came home, the GI Bill, and they started to be able to go to college on the, that, uh, that tuition, that scholarship, Mm-hmm. Colleges even said, like, our the purpose isn't to get you a job. The purpose is to create well-rounded citizens. So, like, how did why did employers start looking to a college degree as sort of a way to filter out employees, and they, it became like the de facto, like, if you don't have a college degree, like, need not apply. Well, that's exactly right. It has has become a sort of sorting mechanism for employers, and you know, it 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 makes sense, right? If your most talented and motivated young people are being directed by their parents and the culture to this one institution, then of course, employers looking for the most talented and motivated young employees are going to look at those institutions and the credentials from those institutions as an important, if not the most important signal for determining where and, and who to who to hire. So, you know, yes, there's there, there, there was and continues to be value added by these institutions. But from my from where I sit, it looks to me a lot more like self selection. Those families uh, and students who are directed to and have the wherewithal and grit to complete the four year, hundred and twenty credit experience are going to be good employees for the most part. Uh, so that's sort of where where college as a signal began to emerge. So it just shows that you're conscientious. You can show up on time. Meet deadlines, et cetera. Well, yeah, that's the that that's the positive way to look at it. The negative way to look at it, and the way that many people do, is that it also means that you have the wealth and family support and family stability to not only you know get into college, but to be supported through college. And of course, that's not true for you know the majority of the of the country. Not everyone is well to do. So you know what 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 once was in the in the sixties and seventies, really an engine of social mobility in many ways, has become a break on social mobility due primarily to the cost. Right, right. And, you know, it's interesting, colleges also, you know, we're here to educate you. You're supposed to, you know, once you finish your four years of an education or five or or six for a lot of people, like you're supposed to think better. 
right? But like you, you highlighted research that a lot of college graduates, like they're really no better than they were when they started. That's right. Yeah, there's a lot of research on that. There's a, a great uh, piece of work from about uh, six years ago called Academically Adrift, which shows that you sort of test folks uh, coming in and, and coming out and you see, you know, for uh, a substantial uh, percentage of college students, really no significant improvement in terms of their uh, their cognitive skills. So that's a that's an issue. But, you know, the the the, the single biggest change that we've seen over the last you know twenty years in, in higher, and this, of course this is this is driven by the cost, which I know we'll 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 get into, is is just that this focus on uh, employment, right? Colleges have always said that you know we prepare you to be a good citizen, we prepare you for your fifth job, not your first job. But we know now, uh, and, and it is, is crystal clear from the research that if you don't get a good first job out of college, you're probably not going to get a good fifth job. Underemployment is often acute in terms of salary differential and persistent, meaning that if you're underemployed in your first job, two thirds of the time you're going to be underemployed five years later, half the time you'll be underemployed 10 years later. And of course, underemployment often means that you're in a job that never required a college degree to begin with. And so raises the question of, you know, why, why did you make that investment? Right. I, think that's, I thought that was interesting because, you know, colleges know that employers use a degree as a way to filter potential employees. And so they know it's like a, it's a, a way to get a job, but like they don't want it. A lot of them don't want to take responsibility for that and say, no, we're not here to help you get a job. We're here to just, you know, make sure you become a better thinker or a better citizen, et cetera. Well, and, and, you know, colleges were not designed with a uh, interface to the labor market in mind. <laughs> Think back to the origins of the uh, instit- in institutions, why they were formed, how they sort of emerged out of the, you know, uh, churches. That was not the, uh, and in fact, the, you know, the, the first professions, of course, colleges trained for was to, to work in as clergy. So, you know, the, the trying to figure out, you know, how to pre- prepare people for entry-level digital marketing jobs was not their priority. But, you know, and, 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 and that's, that's obvious when you take a look at how colleges are, are organized. There's one department within the institution that is peripheral, not sort of highly ranked in the organization. It's called career services. And you sort of look any institution where that reports in, it reports to someone who reports to someone who reports to someone who reports to the provost who reports to the president. So it's not a priority. And the fact that it is a separate part of the university just sends the signal that it's the responsibility of that of that uh, one one unit, and not the responsibility of 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 anyone else at the institution. That is largely the attitude uh, across colleges and universities. We're not responsible for that. That's something that you do. And the reality was that when faculty and administrators were at school 20, 30, 40 years ago, it wasn't nearly as big of a problem. And it wasn't nearly as big of a problem because a they didn't have forty, fifty thousand dollars of student loans to pay back, and b didn't have the employability problems that we have now, which are uh, a function of a how quickly the economy is digitized, b the fact that colleges and universities are are bad at aligning their curriculum with employer employer needs, and c and this is probably the most underrecognized uh, element is that hiring has changed the way that students actually get their first jobs. That whole process has, has changed from even, even 10 years ago. All right, we'll walk through how that process has changed here in a bit. So, I mean, here's the question. Like, why everyone knows college has just gotten super expensive. Like, it's way, way expensive. Like, where's all that money going? Like, if, if it's not, like, if we're not, if we're not uh, creating better thinkers, if it's not helping people get better jobs once they graduate, like, where's the money going? Yeah, well, it's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, colleges and universities measure themselves today not on outputs or outcomes for students, which could include uh, sort of graduate income or employment, but rather on things that are actually easy to observe and measure. So think about it from the standpoint of a, a trustee of a college. You probably go to four meetings a year. Maybe you have you know uh, phone calls in between, but you're not sort of steeped in the in the life of uh, sort of how that. How that school operates on, from, on a day-to-day basis. That's not the, the job of a, of a board member or, or, a, or a trustee. So you look at the things that are actually easy to, uh, to measure. What are those things? Well, you can look at your, your research dollars, the research funding that comes in. That's an easily quantifiable number. You can sort of look year to year at grants and, and so forth. You can look at rankings. And that's a, an obvious and important one. And, you know, some presidents live or die based on 
whether they're improving or or, or declining in the uh, in the U.S. news uh, rankings or or any of the other twenty or so rankings that have followed U.S. news into the rankings racket. The third would be uh, real estate, which is just simply looking outside and seeing a great new building that is has gone up. That's easy to observe, and trustees measure the the uh, the performance of their management teams, leadership of the university on that basis. And then the fourth. Believe it or not, is uh, is athletics <laughs> how your how your teams are performing, particularly if you're from a big school, Division One school with football, basketball. So I, I I put those four together: research rankings, real estate, and and you'll have to pardon me, raw R A H <laughs> for 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 sports as the four R's. Uh, they're sort of the, the the easy inputs to observe, and that's how most trustees hold their management teams accountable. But of course, you know that 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 has nothing to do with outcomes and student welfare, unfortunately. So we're we're in a world where you know your typical uh, and 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 I, I've I've made this point actually in my in my prior my prior book called College Disrupted that in a uh, a not for profit or public uh, organization often there's so many bottom lines that there's really effectively no bottom line. What are you what what are you holding? The president and the provost and your leadership team of the university accountable to uh, as a board member, and uh, the answer is it, it's it's not simple. <laughs> there are multiple. There are often so many bottom lines. There's no bottom line uh, at all. And in ma- at, ma- at many universities, it's really the the leadership, the uni- the the uh, the president, particularly if they're they've been serving for a long time, that really sort of is driving the process with with sort of very little real uh, board or, or trustee oversight. So governance is a big problem in higher education. Right, and you also highlight too that, you know, a lot of money, like you think, oh, we'd hire more teachers, right? But like we actually end up, a lot of universities end up hiring more support staff to support all these things that they're also investing in, real estate, athletics, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we, we call them the deanlets. And if you look at the number of administrators at any college today versus 30 years ago, it's just astounding. It's astounding. If you look at the increase in spending, the increase in spending is obviously reflective of the of the tuition, which has really been sort of twice the rate of inflation for the past 30, 35 years, which obviously is driving the whole student loan and affordability problem. But if you if if if, if you if you if you look at uh, the growth of administrators, you you, you don't see uh, an increase in spending actually in the classroom for the, for, for the most part. Now there's some institutions where there, there, there are exceptions to that, but for the most part, the spending has all been ancillary to the core educational experience. Well, so let's talk about uh, the student debt crisis, right? So young people, they bought into the idea because that's how it is. That's how it's been for, I mean, a good 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. If you wanted a good job, you go to college. So they go to college Back in the 50s and 60s, like when my parents were in college, 70s, like they were telling me about tuition costs. And I was like, geez, that was like the cost of books, yeah. right? Yeah. So it, it, it made sense. You can go to college because you could afford it. But now, because of rising cost, you have to take out all this enormous amount of student debt. But you're told, okay, well, it's okay to take out that debt because you're going to be able to pay it back because it's going to allow you to get a good job. So like, but that's not happening anymore. Right, <laughs> right, right. So, yeah. Wh- why not? So, what's happened? What's changed? The the besides, okay, uh, increasing tuition costs. Why why isn't college paying off like it used to? Maybe even like 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just first on the on the affordability, you're absolutely right that you know in the seventies and even in the, the first half of the eighties, you could literally pay for your tuition uh, by taking a part time job during the year and 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 plus a plus summer job, you pay the whole thing. You take on on, on no debt. So we're in a, we're in a different world now. The average student is graduating with about forty thousand dollars in student loan debt. You have horror stories, of course, of students with hundreds or hundreds of thousands of student loan debt. Typically, that's including graduate school uh, as well. Uh, but it's a huge it's a huge problem. And for for you know uh, up until now, colleges and universities have sort of justified that under the banner of well, a college degree is a college degree, and this is what. You know the elite schools uh, charge the most selective schools, the Ivy League schools charge, and so we can charge some discount to that, right? We've got some sort of uh, anchor price in the market that right now is about sixty thousand dollars a year just tuition. <laughs> and uh, let me let me remind folks that if you're going to school in a in a big city, and increasingly uh, students are opting for sort of large urban schools, uh, the cost of room and board can be another fifteen twenty thousand dollars a year. 
So add that to the add that to the bill, and you see how 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 cost and debt can add up uh, add up quickly. But the big the big problem is now you know, we, we you know the affordability would still work if you know ninety percent of students came out and were going into sort of uh, entry level jobs making fifty sixty thousand dollars a year at companies. That's not happening. And it's not happening uh, because uh, for, 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 for the three reasons I mentioned before. One, uh, the economy is digitized, uh, which means virtually every, every, every good job uh, that a college grad is going to want is going to require some sort of digital or software skills. Colleges aren't teaching those skills, right? You look at so the most commonly used uh, uh, SaaS platform in the market is Salesforce. There may be 20 schools out of 4,000 in the country that actually provide any material training on the Salesforce platform. And it's obvious why. You know, faculty, you know, uh, individuals who go into uh, academia and want to teach, they don't want to teach Salesforce. They view that as vocational training. That's beneath them. Uh, but that's actually what employers are looking for. If you look at over the last 10 years in job descriptions for entry level jobs, technical or digital skills now outnumber all other skills. In those in those job descriptions, and because it's so easy now to apply for uh, an online job posting, virtually you know every job posting generates 300, 400, 500 resumes, and uh, no human hiring manager is capable of sorting through those resumes. So these employers use applicant tracking systems, which are keyword based filters, and if you don't have the requisite density of keywords, which are increasingly digital software. Oriented keywords, uh, you're not going to be visible to employers. So that's a that's a huge problem. And increasingly, these, en- these entry level jobs do require managing some sort of business process through some software platform. Uh, that's what these jobs require. And college students aren't getting them from uh, college. They're they're there's you know I have no quibble, despite what I mentioned about academically adrift before. With the uh, the level of cognitive skill development that colleges do, I think it's as good as it was 30 years ago, 50 years ago, maybe better. But the problem is that the the employer market, the hiring market, uh, has changed. How hiring uh, works has changed, and what employers are looking for has changed. And colleges have not come close to keeping up. I tell a story in the in the book that I'm fond of that sort of describes the the, the attitude of uh, your typical college. There was an article last year in the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is a sort of, you know, the trade paper of college, America's colleges and universities. And it was about how Texas A&M University somehow miraculously managed to develop a cybersecurity uh, degree program in less than two years. And so there was, you know, celebration about that. But then there was this paragraph which said, but, you know, critics are, are asking whether or not the university is wasting its time by doing this, because won't the skills that you know are are uh, and the curriculum in this program won't it be obsolete in five years time and you know that that is an attitude that you just don't see in any any other industry right does apple not develop an iphone because it's going to be obsolete in five years right does you know boston scientific not develop a new medical device because it's going to be obsolete in five years but in higher education that really is the prevailing view uh, is that we don't we don't want to or need to align our curriculum to employer needs because employer needs are going to change. And what we're, what we're teaching is eternal. <laughs> I think that's the, uh, that, that, that properly characterizes the attitude. All right. So students are going into debt to go to college. They're graduating. They don't have the skills they need to, that employers are looking for. So they end up, you know, they're not be unemployed, but as you said, they're, they're underemployed. They end up with a job that's paying far less. I mean, basically they didn't probably didn't need a college degree to even do that job. That's right. And, you know, we say underemployment is uh, acute and persistent. So it's a real problem. So, 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 so students are very focused now. Uh, the stu- students get this, their parents are increasingly getting it, is that it's really about the first job. And again, not discounting the importance of developing the critical uh, thinking and cognitive skills and executive function, everything that's going to make you successful and a good citizen. All that is important, as I say in the book. But right now we have a situation where uh, economically the, the millennial generation is really sort of uh, bleeding out on the table <laughs> and uh, it really calls for triage. And so, you know, we're, we're very focused on fixing the economic situation. Millennials are, have fallen far short 
of prior generations on really every economic benchmark in terms of wealth, income, home ownership, new business creation, you name it. They're behind Generation X, behind the boomer generation. And, 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 and now Gen Z has entered college. And are we going to have a second generation go through this? And, and the impact is severe. I mean, you look at millennials' uh, attitudes towards capitalism, for example. They, they, millennials are skeptical as a group of our market economy. A majority of them in a, in a poll from two years ago state that uh, they think socialism would be a good idea. And I can't blame them. Uh, it's, a, it's a function of the economic outcomes that they've, they've seen, which is a direct product of these two crises of affordability and employability. Okay, we've done a good job, I think, of painting the doom and gloom of the situation, right? Let's talk about what can we do about it? And that you're yeah. highlighting, as you said, cheaper, faster alternatives to college that are actually giving people the skills they need to get that good first job. So you talk about what you call last mile programs yeah. as, as these alternatives. What, what makes a program a last mile program? Yeah, yeah. La- last mile training is a concept that really sort of upends uh, sort of how we've thought about education. Um, historically, it's all been you know, from left to right, right? You sort of start with, you know, K-12 and then higher ed has been uh, about, well, how do you take someone with a high school education and make them more educated? And that's, that, that worked up until, uh, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And then it has broken down for all the reasons we've, we've, we've described. Last mile training starts with the job, starts with the employers. It goes right to left, if you will. The question is, what is the employer looking for for these entry-level jobs, and how do we deliver that as quickly and inexpensively for the student as possible, with as few frictions as possible, right? I mean, they, 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 the, 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 the labor market, if you look at it, you could conceive of it as, as and the reason, and meanwhile, we, there are nearly 7 million unfilled jobs uh, in this country, the majority of which are high-skill, middle-skill jobs. Employers just simply aren't finding the talent for these jobs. So why, why is that? Well, we have these frictions, right? On the, on the student side, you know, it's the, it's the cost of the cost of, uh, of upskilling the time required to, to get those skills and the uncertainty of an employment outcome. So the, the, the concept of last mile training is deliver what employers are looking for and hopefully reduce those, reduce those frictions as much as, uh, as much as possible. And you can do that with a, uh, an approach, which is faster and cheaper. So if you look at what employers are, are missing, they're missing primarily digital skills. There's a, an element of soft skills. There's, there's an element of sort of uh, familiarity with the, with the industry, but it's primarily training on digital skills, on software, on software platforms, on SaaS platforms, and in coding. But, but of course, it's, it's, it's diverse across a range, of, a range of industries. So this is not just training for tech jobs. It's training for tech-enabled jobs. Uh, across every industry. So the, 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 the best example would be, you know, someone who, who operates a, uh, a Salesforce platform, uh, for example, or even a sales uh, entry-level salesperson, right? A decade ago, you would have hired someone out of college for an entry-level sales job and not expected uh, really any, you know, direct sales experience, let alone technology experience. Today, most of those jobs ask for two to three years of experience on a Salesforce platform. So that's the, that's the problem. Last mile training addresses that gap and reduces the frictions for the, for the candidate, reducing the cost, reducing the time, and increasing the likelihood of, an, of, a, of a good employment, uh, employment outcome. The, 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 the first last mile training programs that we saw originated about seven years ago now, and there were these coding, coding boot camps. And they were typically programs for college graduates uh, who were coming out into underemployment. There's, there's a company, Galvanize, that we're, we're involved with. And these are, they're, they're primarily college grads, uh, but, but, but increasingly we're seeing students without college coming into these programs. What they're, what they're teaching you in three or six months is exactly what employers are, are looking for. And it's not just coding. We see it now in business intelligence or data analytics. We see it in digital marketing. And we see it, again, in tech-enabled jobs across a wide range of, uh, of, of, of platforms. Those, those boot camps, uh, were, would, they would charge tuition, uh, but the outcomes that they would achieve for their students were great. You would have something like 90% placement out of those, those programs into 
a year jobs, which is of course the you know the the the, the college uh, the outcome, the outcome the colleges are supposed to be achieving. Uh, so that was what I call version 1.0 of these last mile uh, training programs, and we've uh, we've 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 now we've now progressed uh, to version 2.0 uh, and 3.0. But both of which are sort of better, even better deals uh, for 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 students. Yeah, and the way you describe boot camps, like they're super intense, right? They're like you said, just three to six months. And besides learning those like really specific concrete skills, the way I understand how they work, like you would be on a team and you ha- you have a project, like you'd have to complete within a certain amount of time. That's basically simulated a type of project you would do in like an on the job. Thing. So you had you also learned those soft skills of teamwork, collaboration, et cetera, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, it doesn't feel like school. You're not sort of going into a class. Now, of course, they're you know they're they they are introducing concepts to you, but that's probably maybe you know 10, 15, 30 minutes, and then you get to work. Uh, you get to work, and you're working in teams. You're working in it. it, it it's it's a real work environment, and often these are projects that actually come from the employers uh, who are looking to hire these grads uh, in the first place. Uh, which makes it even even cleaner. So yeah, it's it's effective at and and students 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 you know are there from eight until you know eight at night. I mean, it really is an intense uh, immersive experience. So uh, you know you can you can imagine sort of what level of skill development you can achieve over a three or six month period within an environment like that. So you mentioned that was the first version 1.0. What what is version 2.0, 3.0 of these alternatives to university looking like? Yeah, yeah. So version version 2.0 are what I call income share programs and it, it, if you think about these education frictions that I mentioned before, uh, it just reduces the friction even further by not charging tuition up front. So coding boot camps that charge tuition they would offer private loans and so forth. You know, there's some students who just simply can't afford the ten, fifteen thousand dollars. Income share removes that uh, that friction by the school effectively lends the money to the to the student and takes it back as a percentage of their income over a defined number number of years. So the school is really taking the risk, not the the financial risk, not the not the student. That sends a great signal to the student. That the school has skin in the game and is 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 very going to be very focused on getting a good employment outcome for the uh, for the student and and these income share models they uh, they all have income floors so if you if you don't have a good employment outcome you're not going to pay anything back typically that's you know call it thirty thirty five thousand dollars a year they uh, they are limited in terms of the amount that shared it's typically no more than fifteen percent and it's time capped and dollar capped as well. So typically, no more than three, four years, and you're never going to pay back more than a certain uh, amount. So, if you will, it's sort of like a student loan with uh, insurance. If you get a bad outcome, you don't pay. Uh, you don't pay back. And we see those programs uh, proliferating uh, across the country. It's just a cleaner way to uh, to do it. it. Just removes the friction, and it means that pretty much anyone who's qualified can enroll in one of these uh, last mile programs. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, because with student loans, like you can take out as much loans as you want conceivably, but like you can't default on, like if you don't get a good job, you're stuck with it no matter yeah, what. Yeah, and you default. And one thing we didn't talk about is the impact of default. And there are millions of millennials who've defaulted on their loans. And that's going to, that's, that's going to really limit your life prospects. I mean, that's, that's something that will be on your credit forever. It's, it's um, a stain that you can't wash, wash away. So that's, that, that's version 2.0. And then version 3.0 is uh, what we call employer pay models that simply eliminate the friction altogether because uh, not only is there no tuition uh, because the employer, the end employer is paying, but they're guaranteeing a job. And typically what happens is the program hires you from day one. You're being paid to go to school. So this is really the best of both worlds. And these are the programs that we see uh, scaling uh, fastest. They, They really fall into two categories. The first are what we call staffing models. So these are actually uh, intermediaries that are that are sort of act as staffing or placement companies. Their business is getting you the job and solving a talent or skills gap issue for their clients. So uh, if you qualify, they invest in you. They invest in your training. Uh, they pay you the cost of your training. Some of them even put you up in an apartment for the uh, for the duration of the of the training. In return, you commit to work for that uh, for that company for probably no more than two years. 
and to relocate to where the work is if relocation is in fact required. And they're going to place you with one of their clients. You'll remain an employer employee uh, of them uh, for that uh, for that time frame. And the beauty of these models is that not only does it eliminate the education friction, but it actually eliminates the whole other friction, which is why we have a big skills gap in this country, which is called hiring friction, which is why employers are less likely today than they were 10, 15 years ago to take a flyer on someone with no relevant experience for an entry-level job. There was a study a few weeks ago that showed that 60% of so-called entry-level jobs actually had effectively work experience requirements. So we, we see fewer of these entry-level jobs in America than we did 10, 15 years ago. Employers need to be convinced to take a flyer on someone. And these models are great because they eliminate hiring friction by allowing employers to essentially try before they buy. Employers aren't hiring out of the gate. Uh, they're working with the intermediary, the last mile program. Uh, the last mile program is absorbing all the risk away from the student and the employer and providing what we call a frictionless pathway uh, to a great first job. I mean, this also sounds like an apprenticeship. Yeah, it's, it's, it's similar to an apprenticeship, similar to an apprenticeship. The other model, which is its cousin, is what we call the sort of outsourced apprenticeship. Now, apprenticeships in America have had sort of a troubled history relative to some uh, European countries where apprenticeship is more more established. In this country, we've sort of had a, a hard time really expanding apprenticeships outside of the traditional sort of building and industrial trades where they remain uh, prominent. There are about half a million Americans at any given time doing apprenticeships, but they're almost all in those traditional blue collar building and industrial trades. We see a huge potential for uh, apprenticeships to uh, explode across a wide range of new economy, digital economy jobs, but it's not going to happen at the end uh, employer. If you go to Bank of America and you ask them, how many apprentices would you like to have in your apprenticeship program? They're going to tell you, we'll take five <laughs> or 12. They don't want hundreds of you know, uh, 18, 19 year olds running around their, their offices. And so you know, we see the future uh, as these, what we call outsourced apprenticeships, which is when your service provider, your digital marketing service provider, your cybersecurity service provider, your cloud service provider, your software development service provider, your HR, you know, accounting, any service that you outsource, we see the emergence of sort of an outsourced apprenticeship model where that service provider can essentially amplify their value proposition by also offering talent. It'll be those service providers uh, who will operate these apprentice apprenticeships. And we're seeing the emergence of those uh, those as well. So what's the application process like for these things? Because, you know, it sounds like the employer is taking a lot of risk by paying for this. So like, I'm, I'm sure they want to make sure they get students that they know are going to finish the program and eventually, you know, be, you know, be profitable for them. So yeah, like, how, I mean, do they these, how do they filter that out? Yeah, I'm I mean, sure it's pretty competitive. It's, it's more competitive now than Harvard. <laughs> As you can imagine, if you go out there and, you know, given student preferences today and what we call the employment imperative, if you go out there with, a plat, with, a, with an offer, which is guaranteed job at no cost to you, you get, you know, up to 100 applicants for every, uh, every place. So the key is, and what we're most focused on, is helping to grow the number of seats in these programs. And again, it's, it's not the employer, the end employer who's taking the risk. It's the, it's the intermediary who's taking the risk. It's the staffing company. It's the service provider uh, who's essentially investing in the student and hopefully will be getting uh, paid back over time as they eliminate the hiring friction for the end employer and make a premium for the you know one or two year trial period. But yeah, it's they're 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 selective and they're sorting primarily on cognitive skills uh, right now. So often they're using tests and other measures. They're they're not using degrees, I'll tell you that. But they're using they're using tests and uh, sort of advanced uh, interview uh, techniques to try to assess sort of whether you have the the basic sort of cognitive framework so that in a three month period or six month period with a last mile program, you'll get all the additional skills uh, that you're you're missing. But again, unlike employers, they're not putting those digital skills or technical skills at the top of the uh, of the funnel because they know that they're they're able to create create those to add those in a relatively short period of time. So let's say you are a young person who's about to go to college or maybe you you just graduated college. No, let's, let's focus on if you're thinking about going to college, right? But you're thinking, man, it's going to be really expensive. Like, how do you make that decision? Should I go to college or should I pursue one of these alternative routes? Do you have any like criteria that suggested criteria to help them make that decision? 
Yeah, yeah. I have a matrix in the book where, again, I think it's important to recognize that not all colleges are uh, are equal. That in you know, of four thousand colleges and universities in this country, there are only about two hundred that are uh, what I call selective, meaning they uh, admit fewer than fifty percent of applicants. And those colleges, for the most part, continue to have strong outcomes. Uh, again, you could argue uh, whether that's a result of value add or the caliber of inputs that they're attracting. But those colleges are not the issue. The issue is the other 3,800 colleges and universities. And so, you know, I have a matrix where on the x-axis I say, is this selective or non-selective? And on the y-axis I ask, is it affordable or not affordable? And if you're admitted to a selective school with a, a financial aid package that is affordable, according to the definition that I have in the book, then no one's going to be a bigger cheerleader than I am. You should go to that school. There's so many benefits of getting a college degree from a selective school you know, go with, go with my blessing. On the other hand, if it's a non-selective school and it doesn't pass the affordability threshold, that you should see a, a bright red light. Uh, you, you, you are probably making a bad decision to attend that institution and you should look hard at alternatives. And in the book, we have a directory of 250 of these faster and cheaper alternatives, many of which are local, some of which are, are sort of national across the country. And again, these aren't programs that lead you into traditional blue collar jobs or not to you know, train you to be an electrician or a welder. Those jobs are good jobs and should be accorded respect and you make good money for it. But that's not, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about jobs that are leading you into the uh, pathways that lead you to the jobs that college grads want and aren't getting uh, because they don't have the technical or digital skills to get them. Now, the, the, other, the other quadrants are harder, right? If it's a selective school, but on affordable you know, what do you, what do you do? I actually suggest bending this affordability rule and being a lot more flexible and being willing to take on more debt to attend a selective school. But again, there's, there's a price that it doesn't make sense to pay even for a selective university. And you should look at a, uh, you should look at a, a alternatives in that, in that case. And then, you know, an affordable program at a, a non-selective university, I'm sort of indifferent about that. If you're not going to too much debt, I don't have a problem with it, but again, it, it has to be has to be affordable. Well, what about parents who are listening, and you know they they're doing like every good parent they're you know told they should do as soon as your kid's born, start a five twenty nine college savings account, start socking a little bit in there, because the the interest that accrues in that account is tax free, right? But if you don't use that money for you know at an accredited university and you pull it out, you get I think dinged like I think it's like ten percent. Is what it is. Yeah. yeah. So like I'm I'm doing that with my kids, and I'm as I'm doing that, I'm always worried. Like, man, are, are they even going to go to college? And if they don't, maybe they do this like a boot camp or whatever. Am I going to be like? Am I going to take like this penalty to get this money back out? Well, yeah. I mean, look, it's it never hurts to save. You know, you're probably not worse off saving and paying that penalty than you were of you know not investing in that plan and, and then paying taxes the other the other way. So I I'm, I'm not going to tell everyone that it's a bad idea to save. I think you should, if you can save, you should save. It will come in, it will come in, come in handy. But again, I think what's going to happen is that we'll see a, a fracture here between those schools that are selective and producing uh, good outcomes. And people will be willing to spend money, good money uh, on those schools and uh, schools that aren't. And frankly, it won't make, it won't make sense to spend that kind of money for the outcomes that those schools are uh, are achieving, and so I, I think there there probably will be ten years from now parents who have sort of a full full five twenty nine plans that find that they probably don't have a reason to spend it because their their child wasn't admitted to a selective university and has opted for a faster and cheaper alternative over a non selective school. You know, again, it, it's really a, this is a cultural uh, deal where it took you know a, a period of time to sort of shift to uh, college for all and at college as the only pathway to a successful career and uh, upward mobility. And uh, I think we're, we're now on the, on the other side of that, where over the next decade, we'll see uh, that it, it'll be very clear that there will be hundreds of pathways, not just one. And there will be pathways that are uh, very uh, job specific and industry specific and employer specific. And it's going to be confusing. It's going to be harder. And lots of families are going to say, well, you know, college is simpler and I'll just, you know, continue to go for the the, uh, the tried and true uh, thing. And again, my message is: look, if it's selective school and it's affordable, go with God, but be careful. And uh, you know, the the questioning affordability becomes real 
when there are real alternatives uh, out there that lead to good jobs that parents want for their kids. And that's what we're seeing now. I mean, it sounds what it, what's going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years is that it, college is going to go back to what it was like in the 19th century, right? Like, and for like, basically for rich people to distinguish themselves and like, there would be these other alternatives for everyone else to get the ed- the skills or education they need to get a good job. So like you'll have, I mean, is that, is that a good guess? Maybe like you have fewer people going to college, but people are still doing okay because there's, there's well, these other not. alternatives. Yeah, I hope not. I mean, I hope that I, 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 I talk in the book about how selective schools really have a, an obligation to make sure that uh, they're not just serving the rich, uh, but they're serving uh, those who will benefit most from the experience. And I, I raised the, the concept of what I call distance traveled, which is to say that, you know, you shouldn't admit someone because uh, they're on third base because maybe they were born on third base. You should admit someone who actually hit, hit, hit a triple <laughs> to get the third base. And I know that, you know, most selective schools think about that. I, I know that most of them know they could be doing more to do that. But really, it's, you know, your, your uh, selective schools are, they, they, they should be in the business of training the future leaders uh, of society. And those future leaders need to look like society. Uh, they can't just be, you know, for wealthy and privileged students. And unfortunately, that's, that, that's really, in, from, in many ways, characterizes the situation today. So they have a lot of work to do to avoid that, what I would call dystopia that you just, uh, you just, you just, you just mentioned. But I think, and again, my, my, my point is not that we should see or want to see a reduction in the aggregate or per capita level of post-secondary education in our country, that would be economic suicide. What I am arguing for is a radical restaging of how that post-secondary education occurs, which is to say, you, sh- you don't have to uh, you know, eat it all in one sitting. You, know, you should be able to, in three months, six months, take a last mile program, get a good first job, which is going to be an entry- entry-level job in an industry where you know uh, there's there's a clear sort of career pathway. Do that job for two three years. Look around and figure out what else you need because you are going to need more. There's no question. Your cognitive skills, your leadership skills, your management skills. You're going to need to do more. And I talk in the book about how uh, it's really going to be incumbent on colleges and universities to then provide those secondary and tertiary pathways young people will need. So at the end of the day, whether you went to college uh, and got it all done at once or whether you did a faster and cheaper uh, pathway leading you to a first job and then did a secondary pathway. Think of it like a sort of unbundled master's uh, program. And you did two or three of those. My, my hope is that you'll be in the same place. Uh, but of course, that, uh, that second path uh, where you get the good first job, you get your foot on the first rung of the economic ladder without any debt, that is a sure bet than what we're seeing today where you know almost half of students who enroll in college drop out, don't complete, have debt, and those who do graduate, uh, half of them are uh, underemployed uh, at, uh, at at graduation. So what we're doing now is not working. Some segment of the population is going to benefit from this sort of restaging that we're talking about. And and you know so, so some people in, in in higher ed have have talked for years about sort of lifelong lifelong learning. And really, I think what we're talking about is how lifelong learning actually comes into existence. And it comes into existence by not eating everything in one sitting, but by doing a faster and cheaper pathway to a good first job, a secondary pathway, a tertiary pathway, and recognizing that your learning is never, never done. There's more that you're going to need to do. Ryan, is there any place people can go to learn more about your work that you're doing with these alternative schools? Sure. I mean, you can, I, I tweet at Ryan Craig UV, at Ryan Craig UV. And uh, my, my firm is called University uh, Ventures. You can find us at universityventures.com. Fantastic. Well, Ryan Gregg, thanks so much for coming on. This has been fun. Thanks, Brett. My guest today was Ryan Craig. He's the author of the book, A New You, Faster and Cheaper Alternatives to College. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about his work by going to our show notes at aom.is slash a new you, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. 